Okay. Um, let me begin, um, uh, actually with a cautious issue. Uh, we spoke two times ago. Remember I, I, the issue of Vishalakum and, uh, sushi. I raised it. I don't need to go through the whole thing as to how I came to it through Rabbi Tendler. But I said that, you know, if you look around today, it's clear that, uh, people are eating raw fish. So should that change the halacha? So I looked into it after the class. I think you'll find really interesting what I share with you. And I think Chaim, I see Chaim is with us, uh, for also sending me some sources for this. So uh, again, the issue is a food that's what's called Ola al Shochan Malachim, that you could serve, you know, like at a state dinner, important dinner. Um, um, it has to be cooked by a Jew for Ashkenazim, as long as the Jew is involved in, let's say, turning on the stove, he doesn't actually have to be involved in the whole cooking. That's enough. Uh, but that if we also know that if it's uh, could be eaten raw, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's no such concept of bishalak and be eaten raw, uh, food that you would eat uh, raw or cooked. So today the issue is what about fish because of sushi? Um, and would it apply to all fish or just the specific fish that are eating uh, that are eaten um, raw? So I looked around a bit. The first thing I found, I would say Rabbi Dolph Linzer, he says that uh, if what was cooked was fresh enough to be eaten raw, that is sushi grade, he thinks it is probably excluded from Bishakum. I don't know if that's halacha la maisa because he says it's probably excluded. But I don't know from him, does this mean all fish? Well, okay, certainly for tuna, something like that. But the fact is, if you look around online, you find that that's not the mainstream sock I see. So why isn't it the mainstream sock? It would seem to make sense. So that's where it gets interesting. Uh, first, I have to say, I think it was Chaim who mentioned that um, by tuna, the Vod, I think it was the five towns, maybe you said, they mentioned, uh, they distinguish whether it was uh, uh or not. Uh, he, that's referring to canned tuna. We're not referring to canned tuna. We're referring to regular tuna. So the first thing I saw when I looked around and uh, was, oh, hold on, let me uh, share my screen here with you, is I found an article. Uh, oops, no, where is it? Uh, here, the Dafa Kashras from 2014 on this very question, Sushi and Bishalakum. And who speaks on it? None other than Arfersha Shachter, because he's the... Uh, the postic of the OU, also Roy Belsky. And Rav Schechter has a chiddush, although Rav Belsky agrees with it, that I don't see anyone else say. And you'll see that he didn't used to have this. He thinks, and he has a, it's summarized in English, and also he has a Hebrew tshuva, that, uh, and I don't know if, look, I don't eat sushi, so I can't tell you. I don't know how many of you are going to find this convincing, not just the halachic logic, but even the facts. He says, for instance, sushi is different you, it's not like sashimi. Sashimi is raw fish, but uh, very few people apparently don't eat that. But sushi, lots of people eat. But he says that the intention is not to eat the fish. Rather, the intention is to eat all the components together. And the other components are the majority. And some sushis don't even have fish. Um, fish is an important ingredient, but it's not the most important and uh, therefore, he thinks it's tafel, and you make a br bracha mazonos. Now, I don't know. Is that true? Is sushi, forgetting tuna sushi, is the sushi really tafel? Is it secondary? Uh, that's what he says. He says that you you only eat it together with other with rice or other vegetables. So that's the first uh, chidush. But then he says that uh, therefore it doesn't. It, you you do not regard it as raw fish as if you need it by itself, and therefore Bishalakum still applies because it's secondary. So that that's interesting. And, uh, okay, no one else says that. And all the other sources I'll give you now, that the fact that it's uh, eaten together with something else, me, and I can't find the sources that say this, mean that it's, um, you don't regard it as really raw fish uh, because you're only eating it together with something else. So it's separate. But Ray Belsky agrees with him. Now, what's interesting is that Schechter apparently did not hold like this years ago because thank you, Jacob, for sending me an unpublished responsum from the EOU years ago from Schechter. Very interesting where he asks about this very question. 
And he raises some interesting issues. First of all, he says that Minhagim could be different. He says you have a Minhag in New York, that's one thing, but Minhag in Scranton is something else. So Jacob thought that this was addressed to me because it mentioned Scranton, but it's, it wasn't addressed to me. If you recall from uh, many uh, moons ago, Rav Schechter explains in the letter published in my Sefer, uh, Igros Malcher Rabbonin, that you know, he's from Scranton, he's born there. So when he speaks about Middle America, he doesn't say Peoria, he says Scranton. So when he just wants to say like some town outside a big city uses Scranton. So he raises the question, what do you do if the oh, the food is eaten raw in one place, let's say New York? But it's, he says, he assumes here that uh, people are not eating sushi in small town America. Again, I don't know if that's true or not. But therefore, so he raises the question. Let's say the sushi, let's say in New York, they are eating sushi. If you if it's made in New York, if let's say, if, if, let's, let's say the fish is cooked in New York, and it's eaten in New York. Okay, you could say it's mutter. But let's say it's cooked in New York, but it's eaten in Scranton. And people don't generally eat raw fish in Scranton. So he, he gets into all these uh, discussions of this. But he does say, he says, He says that it would seem that um, in this chuva, he seem, he's saying that uh, uh if it was, that it would be acceptable, uh, he says, and he doesn't seem to take into account the fact that you're eating it together with, uh, he says, sushi is eaten with hirakot, but he says it doesn't seem to, to distinguish it then. He says, in this earlier chuva, or maybe it's a later chuva, I don't know, he seems to be, he, he, he says it would be permissible when it, the fact that you're eating it together wouldn't uh, matter. So that, that there's a contradiction uh, there. He says he says that the fact that you eat it together with the Rakos, he says that that does not take away from the heter. I don't know what Shakhtar's current uh, position is. If you look in other kashras things, the CRC, for instance, uh, they say as well that sushi is eaten with rice and seaweed. The sushi merely adds zing or tang to the cooked food. We don't eat sushi for the fish. And uh, therefore, they say it wouldn't change. However, there's a Kashrus organization called the MK, Montreal Kashrus. So I didn't know much about it. I looked it up, and lo and behold, what does it say? It says that it's the first kosher agency in North America. Now, I heard of them, first kosher agency in North America. I, I could not believe it. How could it be the first agency? But lo and behold, it is. You look here on Wikipedia, MK Kosher is founded in 1922. The that's, OU was founded in 1923. So there Mark, you go. Uh, that, that was news to me. Mark, I'm sorry. It's because Americans know nothing about Canada. Sorry for that. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I, I was <laughs> shocked. I could not believe that MK Kosher is before the OU. But it is. And if you look, they have a whole piece on this. And they say tastes and customs change. And they talk about sushi. And they say, listen to this. Clearly, the avid consumption of raw fish is no longer limited to faraway islands. And the eating of raw fish may become sufficiently commonplace in Western countries for Allah to consider fish exempt from Bishalakum concerns. So the MK assumes that as soon as enough people are eating sushi, then it is. There is no Bishalakum. And they say nothing about the fact it's mixed together. That for them is irrelevant. And uh, also, the, the AskHalacha.com website says, quote, if one is in a city where sushi is not eaten, and most people there would not eat sushi, the fish in that city could not be con considered eaten raw. On the other hand, if you're in a place where they do eat it, again, this website, I don't know who's in charge of this website, uh, they assume that it, it is an issue. It's not an issue. So it's a makokas. Uh, we'll have to see how this uh, develops. Uh, and as I was Looking in the Hebrew sources about this, I found some interesting things. You know, potatoes. We eat potatoes on Pesach. Uh, there was issues. Should potatoes be kidneyos or not? But the Yerach HaShulchan, he deals with potatoes. And it's amazing. He says, uh, potatoes are not Ola al Shulchan Moachim. He says, the Chacham Asadam, the Chai Adam, who, by the way, wanted to make uh, them kidneyos. Uh, he says, the Chai Adam says they are fit for a king. He says that in today's day and age, he says, no, it's a poor man's food. No one would eat it. But the fact is that um, today you'd have to say that the Aruch HaShulchan is wrong or his position doesn't apply anymore. <laughs> because I would say, and I it contradict me if you wish, but you could be at the president's dinner and they'll serve potatoes. 
You know, they'll serve uh, all sorts of potato dishes are served. So I think you know, French fries are not halal shochem lochem, as far as I know. That would not be your shochem. But I think a regular potato dish so be. And then I was looking around. I found the Radbaz, who originally I said he was the last of the uh, Rishonim. So maybe he's the first of the Achronim, or he's somewhere in the middle. He says something which um, is interesting also. I mean, you have all these issues with, uh, well, he says that a... Uh, this is in volume four of his Chuvos, uh, number 1000. He says that I think it's 1000 or 100. I forget what I wrote here. Uh, there's no Bishalakum. And that to me is, uh, is a worthwhile sock to know about uh, because uh, you have, for an example, in Israel, you have um, uh, many older people. And you have uh, these people come, Filipinos and others, who take care of them. So some people, they make a big deal. Bishalakum, they can't cook. Uh, the fact is that the Radbaz, an old person, is the status of a whole Shein Bosakono. And it shouldn't be an issue at all. Not to mention the fact there's this shita that if it's a hired employee, it doesn't apply. But I had this issue, you know, I had an au pair who wasn't Jewish. And uh, so what to do to make food for the children? So there was a, one of the local rabbis, uh, one of these learning groups for the women, I guess, during the week. And a lot of the people had like these non-Jewish helpers said that they can't cook in the house. So remember there was, my wife ended up telling me this because there was a big outcry. What are we supposed to do now? We're not allowed to, uh, I don't know. I never thought that that was the issue, the psaka. In fact, I spoke to a posik and he told me specifically, I asked him this question. I have a non-Jewish, and he said, for a child, she, the, this person can cook the uh, the food. An old, uh, you know, uh, an old person has a status of Chol Hashem uh, I, I would think a child has a status of Chol Hashem Bosakana, but this posek, his reason was the position of the Rivad, not their famous Rivad, the other Rivad, that a, an employee, there's no Bishalakum with a paid employee. That's, that's, uh, we don't generally accept it, but uh, in a situation like uh, you're the child's home, uh, he thought that that was uh, okay. So, uh, but the Radbaz is in an interesting position. Last class, um, I think it was, I, I just wanted to remind you of this. Um, uh, oh, here, you know, this idea of praising yourself and um, the, you know, can you praise yourself at all? The Gemara already uh, permits a little here. In the Darim, it says, um, what is it, 62a, Rava says, it says, in, in a time of need, it is permitted for a person to make himself known where people don't know him. So the Gemara already says, you can explain who you are. You can, uh, so people know you're something. You have to toot your own horn. I mean, otherwise, you'll never get a job. You'll never get anything. But I was talking about the more extreme, like, you know, the I don't need to get into the details. You've all seen the websites and other things that they describe, people describe themselves in the most highfalutin terms. But there is a tradition even to do that, and they, 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 Pun on this pasuk. The pasuk literally is against this. It says in uh, Proverbs chapter twenty-seven, Yael Chazar, another person should praise you, Vlopiicha, but not you, Vlopiicha, not you. But they read it this way, Yael Chazar, someone else should praise you, Vlopiicha. But if not, Sicha, then you do it yourself. And believe it or not, I just saw it today on Wikipedia in Hebrew, you have a whole article on this. Uh, you know, the Zohar quotes this, and uh, it's uh, there's a whole sheet that's about this. Okay. Oh, you know what? I'll say the other thing I want to show you till next time about weddings. Interesting stuff about weddings that we spoke about. But I'll put this aside here because um, it's already 8.45. So let's pick up where we are. All my sorry here. Um, I want to thank uh, Rabbi uh, Dove. Lokech, uh, yes, to get his website up with it. He has beautiful, beautiful articles on um, many different Rabbanim, Gedolim, and uh, um, he sent me a couple, one on one from Rudenberg, another, but uh, and it has a story about the altar. We spoke a lot about the altar, so let me tell you, we, we mentioned also the um, the son of the altar, Ramosha Finkel, who would, he would have taken over the yeshiva in uh, Hebron had he lived. The son-in-law, Rabbi Sher, we'll speak of Sher today in a bit, he would, he would, he took over the yeshiva in Sobotka after the Machogas with the Yerushalmi was uh, completed. And the Ramosha Fink, although he died in 19, um, 
25, Cholom Oed Sukkot of 1926. And the story is, that's reported by an eyewitness, is that when he passed away, only 47, um, the altar did not let a tear fall from his eyes throughout the holiday. He, um, throughout the holiday, uh, and the students were crying, and even Simchas Torah, the altar danced. Uh, but as soon as the holiday was over, then, of course, um, he burst into tears. And we have other similar stories. In fact, Rabbi Lokich quotes a story like that uh, about the Nitziv and uh, similar stories like that. What I want to say, in fact, apparently with the Rav, there's a similar story like that uh, with his brother, I think he found it. Uh, but I, I want to say something here because um, I don't want people to get the wrong impression that, uh, that we're dealing with individuals here who are like you know, Dr. Spock on Star Trek or something, people without any emotions. On the contrary, um, we do have Rabbanim Gedolim who have this Dr. Spock characteristic. The most famous is Ravelville of Risk. For him, Halacha determined everything. He had a child who died before 30 days and his wife was crying and he told his wife, this is mentioned in Uvdos von Hagos Brisk, to stop crying because there's no Avelos. You know, if there's no Avelos, then there's no crying. I mean, that's, but, uh, and we have some of these sorts of stories, of course, in each Halacha, Halacha man. You know, the story of the Baal Tokea, the Chabadnik. I mean, we have these types of stories. But this is exception. This is unusual. And that's not the case of the altar here. It's he was able to control his emotion. But it's not that he didn't have emotion. And it was obviously very hard for him. And that's, I think, you have to understand the, the, this story. And uh, I want to give you an example of this uh, from Rabbi Israel Salander, and, which I think is an amazing story, although... Um, it could be that the yeshiva world tried to uh, alter its original meaning, or maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and it deals with an issue that we all perhaps are focused on, Pidyon Shvuyim. In fact, on Pesach, I'm going to be speaking about Pidyon Shvuyim a bit, because I'm giving a talk on Rav Shomel Gorin. And Rav Gorin held that, what is Pidyon Shvuyim? The, the Mishnah tells you when, um, if someone, let's say, is kidnapped, uh, you cannot ransom this person for more than the person's worth. However, you determine that. Uh, and there's actually two explanations given there. The one explanation is uh, because this would put too much of a stress on the community. And the other explanation is because it would encourage more kidnapping. The nafkamina, the practical nafkamina is that if I'm Elon Musk, you know, if they kidnap my son and they ask for $5 billion, well, I can pay for it. If the reason is not to put the, um, you know, uh, any uh, thing burden on the community. But if the reason is to encourage more kidnappings, then I won't even be allowed to ransom my own son. And the halacha is paskin in the Rambam and Shochan Arach is like the second one. It's so not to encourage more kidnappings. But I can tell you that not only did people who had wealth ransom their children for more than they were, quote, worth, Kal Yisrael never accepted this halacha. The Jewish people have always ransomed for more than people are worth. They did it continuously. We continue to do it. You know, for dead bodies, uh, we release terrorists. Uh, whether it's smart or not, uh, you can debate. But uh, Sinwar was a, himself was released in the Gilat Shalit deal. But uh, it's amazing that here's a halacha, our lawyers would call it black letter law, it's in the Rambam, it's in the Shulchan Aruch, where you can't, and, and by the way, we're not talking about the Mahokas here over a, a, can a parent do it or not? Does the Mahokas, by the way, can a husband release his wife <laughs> for more than she's worth? Some say yes, because she, just like you can release yourself, you can release your wife, uh, you know, Ishto Kagufo. But others actually say, uh, no, you can't. But uh, I can't imagine anyone follow that. But we know historically that Jewish communities always broke this halacha and they paid more then according to halacha, they were supposed to. So what's going on here? I recently, Rabbi in Israel, Neria Gutel, big, big scholar, Talmud Chacham, and he, has, he came out with a book about halacha in the, in the state, and he deals with this matter. So I wrote to him. I don't really know him personally. I know him through correspondence. Uh, and what he said to me was as follows. He said that uh, B'nai Yisrael, Kal Yisrael, Jews, are Rachmani. We're merciful people, and therefore we cannot accept this halacha. So here you have, and it's not like a conservative rabbi saying it, it's not me saying it, it's a big rav and a halachic writer and everything saying that this is one of those examples where the Jew, even though the halacha is clear, the Jewish people could not accept the halacha. In the past, we've spoken about examples where we, we don't accept the halacha for whatever reason. I mentioned the Ragachover. 
The halach is you can't learn when you're an Avel. He said, I can't accept that. If you want to punish me, the Torah is worth it. It's worth being punished for it. Uh, so why do I mention this? Uh, uh, oh, because Rav Goren, by the way, holds that um, when it comes to Israeli soldiers, these rules don't apply. Because we send the soldiers into war and they have to know for their morale that we will do everything we can to bring them back. And it might not, it might be bad to do a deal, and you might not want to do a deal that's lopsided, but according to Halacha, there's no issue whatsoever. And uh you could say that all Israelis are soldiers, but there's other post who say that these issues anyway, opinion and shulim, don't apply to the state of Israel. They apply in an era when they kidnap people for ransoms, for money. It doesn't apply to a country when the considerations are very different. Okay, so why do I mention this? Because the story is told as follows. Rav Yerucham Levavitz tells the following story. Rav Yerucham Levavitz, a student of uh, of uh, the altar and also of uh, Rav Sochaz Yisrael of Kalem, He's known as the Mashkiach of Mir, very important Muslim personality. And he published a book, or it was, it was posthumously, a book was published in 1939, right before the war in Vilna, of his collected, it's called Heather, I think it's uh, Mamari, something strange, first word. And in that book, um, I just printed out the page, but I don't have the title here, page 219, he tells us as follows. He says that this is the story he heard about Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. So there's one genera- two gener- generations away from it, um, that Rabbi Yisrael Salanter was learning Gittin, the sugya, ain podin al shulim. You don't, you're not poda, you don't redeem a captive for more than they're worth because of tikkun olam, because uh, it would lead to chaos, as I mentioned. And he immediately, he started crying. So uh, this is how I always understood the story. And it shows you uh, the emotion. You know, this is it's an amazing sugya, Pinyon Shulim. We can have all sorts of shiurim. It's fascinating. There's lumdis. There's historical elements. You speak of a mayor of Rothenburg. He refused to allow himself to be redeemed. I mean, it's a fascinating sugya. And yet we look at it like this uh, impartially objective way. Yisrael doesn't look at it this way. This is the lacha. You can't redeem them. But this means then that they remain captive. And they're, they remain as hostages. Rav Yisrael learns this, and he starts crying, because that's what he thinks of. We don't have people like that. I mean, it's uh, so I found that unbelievable that he's crying, because he's not just looking at the lundus. He's looking at the fact that uh, someone can't be released, even because the halacha says so. It's a terrible thing. They can't be released, but what can you do? That's the halacha. So that's how I understood the story, but I, I did a, a search today on Otsar Chachma. They reprinted uh, Rav... Um, Yerucham's um, drashos, sichos, and uh, new sichos, and the same story is repeated, but there's an addition to it. And I'm wondering if this addition is correct, or if this is um, this is just the the person who recorded it, his interpretation of it. Why? What? Because why did according to this, why did Rav Yisrael uh, cry? He cried um, because. Uh, He's crying about the Mesiris Nefesh of the father who, let's say, can't re- or the, who can't redeem his child. And that's sad. Okay, so look, that's something to cry about also. But in this version, he's crying because of the tragedy of someone who, because of halacha, can't redeem the child. And uh, so it's sad. It's like you might cry. I, I mean, you can think of all sorts of examples. However, the way I saw it was, no, the crying wasn't because the the tragedy of someone who wants to redeem and can't redeem. If you look at the initial version, they don't say that. And I just assume the tragedy is that the person still has to remain a hostage. So either way you look at it, you see, though, the emotion there, that we're not dealing with uh, any Spock here. Um, Okay, uh, we are now back to Sabatka. Take all my papers here. Um, we're in Sabatka. And as I was explaining, the altar of Sabatka, we, we began speaking about it. And I looked up instantly as to why he's called the altar. I was asked that. Uh, and um, it's he mentions it in um, 12 Cats in volume um, three. Volume three of Tanur Samusar is direct, devoted to the altar. On page 209, he says he was actually given this title when he was a young man. Not an old man, the altar, and uh, it's. Uh, it, it, I mean, his name was. They called him the Mashkiach, and after a while, uh, 
they assume, they realize that this title Mashkiach doesn't really encompass everything he does, and they started calling him the altar, the son or the Saba in Hebrew. And uh, but they, they did that we don't know why really. Uh, and he was it's not like I said. I guess they saw him as a grandfatherly figure because already as a, in, as a young man they were calling him this. So we we know that the altar attempted and succeeded in many time, cases to profoundly shape the personality of the students. All aspects of their life came under his watchful eye. He would have deep and close conversations with them, trying to get to the bottom of their souls. He used all sorts of educational tools, the sorts of things that if you're not into this are going to turn you off and lead to the rebellion. We'll see in a few minutes. Under the conditions of Sabotka, where they're watching you this way and uh, trying to get into your life, and uh, you know the altar of Sabotka wanted to put a spy in Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg's room. He thought he was going into Haskalah, all these sorts of things. It was much more difficult for students to become adherents of Haskalah or Chibat Zion than in places like Volozhin, where despite some attempts at supervision, for the most part, the students were not very closely monitored. Another important difference between Sabotka and, of course, later almost yeshivas. And Volozhin is that in a place like Volozhin, there was no focus on the form of self-introspection that we've spoken about, designed to improve your character, increase your fear of heaven. It was thought that the important thing to do in yeshiva is to learn Gemara, and done properly, that will lead to the fear of heaven and everything you need. What does it say? If you uh, fear of sin, you know, drag it, drag your eight hour to the base medrash. Anything else is used as a distraction. So yes, on a, on a weekend, if you want to open up a Masiyos Hasharim, it's a nice thing, but you don't break Seder for that, for a yeshiva bacher learning. And incidentally, why you? I asked my son. They they have Musr, like in the week, in the evening, you'll have a Musr Shmuz, the Rebbe maybe once a week will say some Musr, the Mashkikim will come into the base Medrash, but there is not anything in the base Medrash that sets Seder, where every night, let's say 8 to 8.30, you put away the Gemara and you you all learn Musr together. That's what they did in Musr Yeshivas. They don't do that in YU. And uh, in a place like Volajan, character improvement, fear of heaven, obviously these are important, but uh, they were not, they did not merit special concern. Let's put it this way. Yeah. Now, as we mentioned last class, uh, Volajan is closed down. And uh, many of these students uh, from Volajan, uh, they end up in Slobodka. The, the, the conflict we're going to see right now is really the altar's fault. Uh, he brought this into his yeshiva because he had a weakness. His weakness was for Lamdanim. He he loved more than anything else a young man who was who could who was an Eloi, who was a great Torah scholar, and he didn't really care anything else. He's an Eloi, and that's it. And therefore, he didn't weed out the people who would not be amenable to the Musr approach. So that's going to create the problems. The, the, the Volashen Yeshiva, as we know, is closed for, by the Tsar, Tsar's government in 1892. Ostensibly, the reason is because they won't institute uh, secular studies there, but uh, we know now that that was just um, uh, a cover, that the real reason is because there was all sorts of um, chaos, I guess you could say, in the Yeshiva over... Uh, Rav Chaim Berlin, and this, they thought that the government thought there was a like revolution growing there, and therefore they shut it down. There was always a question. There's a lot of yeshivas in the Russian Empire. They don't require secular studies at the other yeshiva. Why all of a sudden Volozhin? So we know it was more complicated than that. So now you have all these students who uh, want to go to a yeshiva. Furthermore, um, the Slobodka yeshiva developed a reputation as one that had funds. They gave good stipends for the students. So all sorts of people now want to go to the Slobodka Yeshiva, and they're not interested in um, in Musr. And that's going to be the problem. Now, the Volozhin Yeshiva was closed down. And the Roshi Yeshiva, you know, uh, went their special separate ways. Then the Tziv would die the next year, or Chaim would become Rav and Brisk. The Yeshiva would reopen a few years later. But it didn't have its leading lights. It didn't have um, Rav Chaim. And then it's if, um, and therefore the gifted students uh, didn't return there. They went to other places. If you went to Slobodka, you could study under two of the great Rabbanim Gedoli, brothers-in-law, Rav Zaman Meltzer and Rav Moshe Mordechai Epstein. And if you if you if you're part of the yeshiva world, you know that uh, you know their last names are never even used. You just say Rav Zaman. There's only one Rav Zaman and Rav Moshe Mordechai. Uh, 
There's an album in the Evan Hezo, Evan Hazo, actually, it should be, and uh, the Ravush Mordechai. So these were great Rosh Yeshiva. Now, we, and as I said, the Alter accepted students who had no desire to be part of the Muslim environment because they just wanted to learn because he loved Torah students. And you had people in that yeshiva from bar mitzvah age into their late 20s. Uh, although the, uh, we know there, Mrs. Alman would go in 1897. We saw he'd go to Slutsk, but uh, he was there in 1892. Although the students, these new students from Volozhin and other places were now in the confines of a Musa yeshiva, the first Musa yeshiva, many of them still believe that they could act as if they're in Volozhin, simply just study Gemara and ignore everything else. Ignore the alter's demands that they have to focus on their personality, on a Musar. It doesn't just come from learning Gemara. These students, that is, these opposing students, were actually encouraged by many leading rabbis, including the Rav of Kovno. The Rav of Kovno at this time was, his name was Ritzvi Hirsch Rabinowitz. He was, um, in fact, hold on, I will tell you... um, his father was uh, Yitzhak Ochon Inspector, the the great uh, the great Gadol. So he dies in 1896. So by um, 1897, you know that's the when everything really starts heating up. Ritzvi um, Hershobinowitz becomes Rav uh, within a year or two after. I'll tell you right now exactly. Hold on, so so we have the the facts here. Um, the exact year that Svi Hirsch Rabinowitz, Svi Hirsch Rabinowitz, well, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why he um, was called um, Rabinowitz, because there's some uh, uh, confusion, I guess, about this. Hold on a second. Uh, I just want to tell you before we go on, because it's important for the story, why uh, I forgot to mention this here, what year he becomes, uh, I'm looking, um, if I can see quickly, um, because he was Ravin and he was in business, by the way, or Sirius Rabinowitz. And then later he comes, okay, I will, I, I can't, yeah, in 1896, he's appointed rabbi in uh, Kovda, Sirius Rabinowitz. Uh, in fact, um, I don't know how many of you have uh, uh, been to Kovno, but uh, you can um, you can go see his grave in uh, Kovno. Um, um, in fact, I, I believe I... Uh, I took a picture of it. I thought, uh, if I'm confused here, uh, I can show you the picture I took of. Um, yeah, I took a, uh, when I was there last summer, um, or two summers ago, here, let me show you a picture of their grave right next to each other. Hold on, let me uh, share it with you. It is just a grave of uh, the two of them, uh, Ritzvi Shabinowitz and uh, Rav Yitzchak Inspector. Okay, so Ritzvi Shabinowitz, the Rav of Kovno, Kovno is right next to Sabatka, opponent of Musser, encouraging the students against him. Who else is an opponent of Musser? Ramosha Donashevsky. If you know Donashevsky's, I assume they're all descended or related. Um, Moshe Donashevsky, he's the Rav of Sabatka, also an opponent of uh, Musser. In fact, they weren't just opponents of Musser, they were leading the assault on the organized study of Musser. And these rabbis, their attitude was, we've already seen that this is creating a sect, uh, some sort of phony elitist movement. They thought it was uh, threatening the hegemony of Talmud in the curriculum. And by the way, in this, they were correct, because the, the Musser students thought that the study of Musser was just as important as the study of Gemara. You don't devote as much time to it, but on the scale of things, it's just important. And they saw themselves as an elite group. And, you know, some people are good at Musser, others are good at uh, are good at uh, Gemara. Now, the students, the anti muster students, were also creating problems because they were writing to the various rabbis. And they were also writing, they have letters in the newspaper on Meilitz asking for the altar to being removed from his position because he's interfering with their learning. No, it's the altar's yeshiva, for heaven's sakes. This is like a hostile takeover. They want the altar removed from his yeshiva. I want to read you something now from uh, this book. This is by Shlomo Tikoshinsky. It's called Amdanut Musar Velitism, Yeshiva Sabotka Melita Eretz Yisrael. And uh, it's a great book, um, all about uh, the yeshiva, the ideology, the machokas. On pages 38-39, he speaks about the, the breakout of this uh, whole dispute. And um, his argument here is that the, 
the rebellion is not like we're going to see in tells ideological where it's the students oppose Musser and therefore they, uh, they um, he thinks they are, and therefore they rebel. He thinks in Musser, it's more about uh, the fact that they're getting in your life, they're not giving you freedoms. The give more money to the Musser students. We know that, so that created lots of resentment. Now the altar had a reason; he wanted to encourage the Musser students, so the Musser students got more money. So he—that's his argument. Um, here and uh, so he thinks it's a, he thinks that the great dispute we're going to see now was more about uh, lack of personal freedoms, the 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 the, the mashkiach, the altar getting in people's way, getting in their lives, bothering them, the the, the unfairness they thought that the non muslim students are being per- discriminated against in terms of funding, uh, and remember that um, in in, in tells. The head of Tells is Rav Lazar Gordon. He's the Rosh Yeshiva. So fine, they have a Mashkiach there. But the Yeshiva itself is not identified with Musser the way Sobotka is when the um, the head of it is himself a great uh, Musser personality. So that's an interesting argument. I don't know if it's correct or not, but that's his argument. Well, it wasn't long. In 1897, it wasn't long before a clear majority of the students were opposed not just to Musser, but to the altar of Sobotka. And they wanted him gone. And the yeshiva was split into two sections. And if you wonder how this could happen, yeshiva split into two sections. Well, it happens today, too. Uh, today, uh, the Ponovej yeshiva split into two sections. We've seen it. Uh, we've seen it uh, a number of times. Um, and the anti, as I said, the anti muslim students, they focus on the altar. They don't want to have to listen to a schmoozing. I mean, from their perspective, all of a sudden, they're in the middle of learning, and then he cops down, and everyone has to put away the Gomorrahs, listen to the schmooze, and that to them is, is not important. In fact, it's reported that, and again, some of these kids were eight teenagers. You know, um, it, it's not like they have sports. It's not like they can do fun things. They're, they're mischievous. Uh, they, well, that can explain some of this. So we know that Musser books were stolen from the yeshiva, were removed from the yeshiva. So when it's time to learn Musser, there's no more Musser books. That's the sort of prank that a young person uh, would do. We know that when the mashkiach, when uh, the altar um, stood in front to give his shmuz, a number of students started learning very loud. That is, not only did they... They, they weren't not just quiet, but they would start learning. Hey, let's see us, you know, whatever they're saying. Um, so you couldn't hear them as a complete show of disrespect. By the way, I've shown you in the past, if you recall, I showed you a video from Ponovej where one guy gets up to lead the Shimon Esrei and the other guy gets up and uh, makes a big noise so he can't because they're from different sections. In fact, it's reported that a fight, an actual fight, broke out in the base Medrash in Sobotka. And you could see video of the fight bro- that broke out in uh, the Panovej base Medrash. They actually threw chairs. I don't know if they threw chairs in uh, Sobotka, but a real fight. Well, uh, you weren't going to have any compromises here because uh, the altar of Sobotka, it's his yeshiva, and uh, he's not going to accept any compromise when it comes to the study of Musser. The only option would be to drive him out. But how are you going to drive him out? Uh, now, from the side of the Musser Knicks, the anti Musser Knicks are a bunch of scoundrels who, because uh, they're trying to destroy Yeshiva, because they're not given the money they want, because, uh, you know, they, they came to this Yeshiva, they knew what type of Yeshiva it is. They come to a Yeshiva, it's not like with Tells. Tells they came to a regular Yeshiva, which also has some Musser. So you could say, I guess maybe they had more of a justification for what they did. But here they came to this yeshiva. That was the altar's yeshiva. He started it, and they want to get rid of him. That's There's something wrong with that. Um, and we don't know the role, really, of the Maskili. They were definitely encouraging the um, they were encouraging the anti muslim students because they, they opposed the Muslim leaders. They thought that the non muslim people, they thought incorrectly, the non muslim people would be more sympathetic uh, but we don't know exactly among the yeshiva students how many of them were influenced by them. But the, the, the Muskegon would write about this dispute in the newspapers. The anti muslim Knicks succeed in 1897. The controversy becomes so bitter that the yeshiva has to split. The way it's described by Katz in his book, uh, Pumas of Musar, is as follows. Ritzvi Rabinowitz, the Rav of Kovno, invites Rav Yitzhak Blazer, a great Musar teacher, at this time in Sobotka and um, um, the altar, to a meeting with communal leaders. 
It's described in Cats on pages 98 to 99. And um, they, they, they want to have this big meeting. So they have a big asifa with community leaders, communal leaders from Kovno. And uh, here is Rav Yitzhak Blazer and the altar. And uh, Rav Yitzhak Blazer, it's reported, sits there, listens to the, all their attacks, the terrible things they're saying about the Sabbatki Yeshiva, canars, uh, which are not true. And after listening to this, I don't know how it went on, a half hour, an hour, whatever it is, he says to them, okay, good night. He gets up and walks out. Doesn't even attempt to defend the yeshiva's method, the yeshiva's approach. He saw no need to defend it because in his mind, there's no way they're going to accept this. And um, the same thing uh, with the um, the altar. Uh, he says that we were given this tradition of Musa. We're not going to move from it. Now, Okay, so the yeshiva splits. What does this mean? Um, well, um, one quarter of the students, there's about between 250 and 300 students, one quarter of them remained with the Musar side, so figure 60 or so. And the, the majority, uh, three quarters of the 250 and 300 students, they remained the other side. So you think they would be kicked out. No, the altar leaves the yeshiva, and he opens up his new yeshiva. So what's going on here? Well, they didn't own the yeshiva. If it was his building, then he'd kick them out. He didn't. They were learning in what's called the base medrash hayashon. Obviously, it was a big base medrash, but it belonged to the community. And um, so the fact is that the, uh, the anti muslim sides were the majority. So uh, I assume the altar thought, uh, it's time for us to leave. He takes his 60 or 70 Talmidim, and they go they to, to a base Knesset called Havaya Sameis. You know, the people whose job it was to deal with, uh, you know, the burial society. Every group has their own shul. And he sets up his own uh, yeshiva over there. Um, by the way, in 1900, they do get a building. And in 1934, they open another building which was given to them by the city of Sabaka, which is uh, the city of in Lithuania. And I looked for that when I was there. And look, I don't know. I had a guide who apparently she knows all this. And she said the building doesn't exist anymore um, of uh, this yeshiva, this, this yeshiva. So I, I don't know if any man made. Um, and she actually, when Schneider Lyman did his tour, she was like the, the regular guide. But I have to ask Schneider Lyman, maybe the building does exist. Uh, but now, oh, oh, so one more thing. So who's in the yeshiva now? You have the altar, but you also have Ramosha Mordechai, Ramosha Mordechai Epstein. And he's the sole Rosh Yeshiva. So, and he wasn't involved in the Musar movement. He doesn't come from a Musar background. He's from Volozhin. Uh, there was some suspense. What, where's he going to go? The altar is taking his students, 60 or 70 students. They leave. The other students remain. Where's Hermosha Mordechai going to go? Hermosha Mordechai goes with the altar. And uh, very disappointing for the rebels. Uh, the Hermosha Mordechai goes with the altar. So then they need uh, the students who remain, the anti muslim students, they need a Rosh Yeshiva. Well, uh, the Yeshiva for a time would then be run by Ritzir Benowitz, the Rav of Kovno, and Hermosha Dostoevsky, the Rav of Slobodka. This was the anti muslim Yeshiva. And the anti muslim yeshiva chose a name, Kines, Knesset Space Yitzchak. That's the name, Knesset Space Yitzchak, named Yitzchak as Yitzchak's son, Inspector. Later, it would be it would move to a place called Kamenitz, and it was uh, run by uh, the Rosh Yeshiva was Rebbech by Lebovitz. The the altar's original yeshiva, the one that actually had to break away. Um, I mean, it's the original yeshiva, so which is the breakaway? Really, the altar's yeshiva is the breakaway because they actually leave and break away, but they're the original yeshiva. They choose the name Knesset Yisrael, as in Yisrael Sonder. So from this point on, there are two yeshivas in Slobodka until later this, that one yeshiva moves um, after World War One. sometime it moves, to, or during World War One, I, I forget now, it moves to... Um, also it ends up in Kamenetz. But if you're talking, let's say, the year 1905, and someone says they studied Sabatki Yeshiva, you have to ask them, which Sabatki Yeshiva? Are you, you have to say, which Sabatki Yeshiva? Can this be Tzitzvah or can this is, uh, Yisro? So now we have on the Musa Yeshiva, you'd think no anti muslim forces in it. Just wait. Within five years, we're back to where we were. Um, but before we get to that, now the Maskilim are jumping for joy. 
because you have the anti Musa yeshiva, and the Muskelim thought they can turn us into a yeshiva more inclined to Haskalah, because he got rid of these, uh, you know, extremists, people like Ravitsa Blasser and uh, the, the altar of Sabaka. Now you can have a more modern yeshiva. But that never happened. In fact, in Pumos Musa, page 100, um, he he quotes from an article that they they wrote in Hamelitz. Now, now is the time, they say, to establish this yeshiva. Now that the Muslims are gone, that there can be haskala ivrit, and they can get a secular education. And they really thought they could, but uh, it was never going to happen. And uh, the Rav Tzvirbinowitz and Moshe Donshevsky made it clear that this was going to remain a traditional yeshiva. No Haskalah at all. So Knesset Beit Zitzcha continues the Volozhin approach and uh, Knesset Yisrael, the Musa approach. Okay. So what, what was the altar able to accomplish then in Knesset Yisrael? Well, um, first of all, you have Torah learning at the highest level with Ramosha Mordechai Epstein. The idea that a Musa Yeshiva wouldn't have Gemara learning at a high level is, of course, false. The altar, however, was able to really thrive in his Musa Shmuzim, which we know from the descriptions. We have many descriptions were very influential. He integrated Talmudic logic, halachic issues, um, and um, with his Musa, and he showed that the f- traditional focus of the yeshiva does not stand in opposition to Musa. That Musa helps the yeshiva. You know, the we have descriptions of how the students would relate to the altars shir, in his shir, in his sihos. After the sicha, the students would come together and they debate it, just like they would do after the Rosh Hashiva's shir. Um, and this really was a fulfillment of the dream of the Rishol Salanter, that you have a synthesis of Talmud study and Musar, and the two don't need to stand in contradiction. Now, there's another book, a uh, valuable book. It's called uh, Yeshiva Slita, Pirkei Zichronos, Pirkei Zichronos, Memoirs. From all the different yeshivas, from different individuals, um, and um, it, it's really great. And uh, in um, here yeah, you have memoirs of the um, Tells yeshiva and the Machokas there. So what I'm going to read you now or summarize for you is from a rav of Yerucham Bar Haftig. He's this father. He, there's a lot of our Haftigs in Israel. He's their forefather, um, Zorach Bar Haftig, who we spoke about. Uh, he was very involved in the rescue from getting people out of the of, Kov, of Lithuania. Um, he was the son of Rav Yerucham. But in recalling the, the dispute at the Tells Yeshiva, which we will deal with, uh, he explains that, and the same thing applies to Sabatka, that um, you had these Musa students who would say, you're great in Talmud study, but I'm great in Yira. Atem giburim b'Torah, v'nachlu giburim b'Yira. You know, that there's different ways of being a, a good Yeshiva Bachar in Sabatka. Not everyone could be the great Islamdin, but then you could excel in other areas. So uh, was the altar a gone in learning? Or was he just a mashkiach who uh, could uh, inspire people? The tradition in the Musur, in, in the yeshiva is, and Kamenetsky, who does not adopt hagiography at all, he quotes his father as the altar was a lamdin, lamdin muvak, and others say the same thing. However, I have to say that Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg, who knew the altar as close as anyone during the time he was there, the early uh, 20th century, in his famous, maybe famous because I made it famous, but his famous conversations which in Yiddish with Yaakov Herzog, which you can listen to them on YouTube. And I can send anyone who reads Yiddish a transcript, but it's explosive stuff, some of the stuff in there. So, but uh, in his transcript, in his conversation, he says as follows. He says, um, um, he says that the altar is at Sadiq. Yaakov Herzog asks him, Aber nicht kein Lamdin? What he, is he, he's a, he's a Lamdin? And, the, and Rav Weinberg says, nicht kein größer Lamdin. He's not a great Lamdin. Er hat gekannt learn, and he knew how to learn. Aber er ist nicht gewähnt kein größer Lamdin. Aber er ist gewähnt a Chochem, a größer Chochem. So here you have Rav Weinberg saying that uh, I mean, he's a London. I mean, knows he's, but he's not. He's not Rosh Hashiva quality. That is, he couldn't give a shear to the high level. That's why you have Ramosha Mordechai Epstein. I understand this doesn't fit in to the yeshiva, you know, history that uh, says that the altar could have given you 
uh, shearing, but he chose not to because he saw something that in his day he thought was more important. A lot of people could give shearing, but who's going to teach Yira? Who's going to teach the things he's teaching about? Rabbi Weinberg says, no, it's not true. Rabbi Shal Salanter could have. There's no doubt Rabbi Shal Salanter was a goan in learning, in addition to that. But does every mashkiach need to be also be a goan in learning? Rabbi Weinberg doesn't uh, think so. And um, there are some other elements of um, of um, Slavotka history. I'll just tell you this now, and I guess so. To get to the next class, I'll explain why Ritzvi Rabinowitz has a different name than his father. But let me tell you some other things about Slavotka, because in this interview, I mean, Rabbi Shak of Weinberg is from the royalty of Slavotka. Uh, the altar predicted he'd be the God of Hador. It never exactly worked out that way, for the, maybe because of the personal issues that he happened, had. But he was uh, so, so close, and Rabbi um, Kamenetsky quotes, and he didn't have access to what, what I'm reading now, but he had access to personal letters to Dove Katz, which I also have access to subsequent to my book, which is why I didn't quote it, in which Rabbi Weinberg reveals such interesting things with him in the altar, and he was a bit of a chutzpahdik also, Rabbi Weinberg to the altar, uh, challenging him at certain times, but um, there's also something else which is worth mentioning in these discussions with um, with Yaakov Herzog, which, uh, because it's part of Sabbat history that um, was censored in Yatayn um, and Yatayn Neman got a hold of uh, before before it was released. Um, it, they got a hold of the tape and uh, they published uh, the conversations, but in a censored form. So, for instance, this is what appears in Yatayn Neman. Rabbi Weinberg telling Herzog, I was intimately acquainted with, with Isaac Sher. Isaac Sher was the son-in-law of the altar, becomes Rosh Hashiva Sobotka. His son-in-law, Mordechai Shulman, visited me in Berlin and wanted to hear Shirim from me. I told him, this is not your place. That is the Berlin Original Seminary. Go back to Sobotka. Maybe someday you can become the son-in-law of Rabbi Isaac Sher. And that's actually what happened. He became the son of law. But that's not what Rabbi Weinberg reports to Herzog. He actually said it's in Yiddish, but I'll summarize it for you now. He tells Herzog the Ramordechai Shulman. Ramordechai Shulman becomes the Rosh Hashimah of Sabotka after Rabbi Shem. And there's a uh, there's a picture in one of the Art Scroll books. Uh, in fact, uh, let me sh- pull up here a picture of it uh, just so you see uh, all these. Um, all these rabbis would then, uh, after the war, would come to visit uh, Rabbi Weinberg. So I'm going to show you a picture here when I f- from an art scroll book, actually. Here is um, in the 50s, early 60s, uh, Rabbi Weinberg uh, meeting with uh, Ramor HaShoman, who became uh, Slobodka Rosh Yeshiva after Rabbi Sher. You know that among yeshivas, it's often the son-in-law who becomes the takes over, because the son sometimes isn't up to the task. The son-in-law, though, is always up to par because the father, because the father of the bride picks the son-in-law in those days. So you can be sure he's only going to pick a lambda. The son could be a lambda, maybe he's not a lambda. At um, Remendel Zax's funeral, the son-in-law of the Chavetz Chaim, Yevakov Kamenetsky. Um, he had a very short eulogy, and he said that uh, we know that uh, he, he didn't only say this, but this is after a couple of psukim, whatever he did, Maimre Chazal, he said that uh, we know that in Lithuania, the son-in-laws took over as Rosh Hashiva often, and he says the reason for that is because uh, what I just said, that uh, the fathers would only pick the son-in-law if they knew they were a great lambda. The fact that the Chavitz Chayim picked Remendel Zaks. That says enough that you don't need to say any more about it. But what did Rabbi Weinberg actually tell Herzog? He says that um, uh, Rabbi Shulman, in those days he wasn't Rabbi, Mordechai Shulman, he came to Berlin. Why? Not to hear Shi'urim from me, to enroll in the Berlin Rabbinical Seminary. Now, Yatay Neman doesn't want its readers to know about that, so it translates that, that Rabbi Shulman visited uh, Rabbi Weinberg, and wanted to hear Shirin from him. In the actual description, Rabbi Weinberg tells Herzog, Gagaf Herzog, that he tells Shulman, you'll never get a doctorate here. So why are you going to stay here? And even if you did get a doctorate, you're never going to get a rabbinic position in Germany. So go back to Sabaka. And then he adds, it could be when you return to Sabaka, you'll fall in love 
with the daughter of Rav Sher. He says, um, it could be when, or she'll fall in love with you. It could be when your turn, du wirst sich verlieben, oder sie wird sich in dir verlieben. I speak, I, I know German, so I don't know how my Yiddish sounds. But what he's saying is they told her, Rav Shulman, go back to Sabatka. Maybe you'll fall in love with her. She'll fall in love with you and you'll become, I, I mean, it's funny. He says, uh, it could be that uh, you'll fall in love with her or she'll fall in love with you. I Wouldn't it be good if they both fall in love with each other? <laughs> but I guess if she falls in love with you, at least you get the Rosh Hashim, like maybe, I don't know. But that's what it says. Uh, and then he can become the son of Rosh Hashim, the Rosh Hashim of Sabaka, And that's what happened. Of course, they omit this thing about falling in love. But that's what Rabbi Weinberg says. And uh, um, and that's part of the uh, tradition. Um, but I'll tell you something else now. That doesn't appear in any book, but it comes from a reliable source. When I say reliable, I mean as reliable as you can get in these matters. It's, n- it's never appeared in print. And I don't know why the yeshiva world wouldn't like this story, because the answer is a mystery. But uh, the story is that Rabbi Hutner also had his eyes on the daughter of Rabbi Sher. And that uh, when he didn't get that shidduch, he was devastated and he needed to get away from Sabatka. And that's why for a time, um, it was only a few months, he went to Berlin. He just had to get away and uh, start anew. That's the story that was known in um, in the world of Sabatka, that story. You know, um, um, it's never, it won't be written because, uh, first of all, the idea of, you know, wanting to, a shidduch or something, I mean, you're, it somehow doesn't fit with the uh, yeshiva mentality or the idea that then you'd uh, be depressed and want to leave. But on the other hand, this actually answers a question. I would think in the yeshiva, would they like this? Because it's always a big mystery. Why did Rufutner go to Berlin? Rufutner, he wants to study secular studies. He wants to go to Berlin. I mean, we can understand why Rabbi Weinberg goes to Berlin, where Rabbi Soloveitchik. For others, it's a big problem. Like, Dobav Cherebi, why is he going to Berlin? I mean, so Rufutner, why is he going to Berlin? Uh, this answers it. You know, he was very upset. He didn't get the shidduch he wanted. Can't Rosh Yeshiva also want a shidduch? And therefore he goes to Berlin. So it's not that he goes to Berlin because Chas Hashem, he wants to study secular subjects. He needs to get out of the, yesh- the environment of uh, Sabotka. So uh, he goes to Berlin. But that that's the story that was known in Sabotka. Rabbi Hutner wanted to marry her. And then, of course, he would have been the Rosh Yeshiva of Sabotka. And instead of Rabbi Shulman uh, married her. Okay, uh, so we're done for today. Uh, next class, of course, um, we can, uh, you know, all we've so, seen so far is the Musr, is the Sabatki Yeshiva. But this then breaks out in the end of 1897, the entire rabbinic world is split. Pishkavilin, uh, opposite Pashkavilin. The greatest rabbis of the day come out with crazy, outrageous statements if you're a Musr person. And then the Musr rabbis come out with defenses of the Muslim movement and crazy statements of you're an anti-Muslim person. The Torah world was split. Split like it hadn't been for since the days of the Hasidim. So uh, over 100 years, uh, 150 years, it was split. But it was a split that really took place just in the intellectual class. I don't think the average Jew, with all the stuff I'm going to quote from you, these took place in, in, in the Hebrew journals and in newspapers. I don't think the average Jew had any clue as to what was going on in this ideological dispute that, um, again, as we've mentioned, really ends with a complete victory of even, for Musa, even Knesset Beis Yitzchak, even Volashen would later have a Musa Mashkiach. So uh, what can you do? Uh, um, so let's pick up with some, um, Ruth says, sushi is a lot of rice and smidge is something else. Okay, so what's the bracha on sushi? Rav Shechter holds the bracha according to the, the second tshuva, the bracha is uh, mizonos, because it's only the rice. Um, that's the second letter. Um, others hold that you actually make two brachas. You're supposed to make the bracha on the rice and then take the fish and make the bracha on the fish. Well, if that's the case, then you are eating the sushi separately. Then the whole issue of bushel akum comes to the fore again. You're eating it raw. Again, I don't eat sushi, so I don't know what the general practice is. Based on what you say, Ruth, it would seem that you would make only Mizonos because it's mostly rice. And uh, I don't know. Uh, and an important rabbi texts me that he makes Mizonos on sushi. So rabbi I guess... Um, right, Rabbi um, well, yeah. I, don't, I hate sushi. Yeah. I, I don't eat it. To me, 
it's a bunch of rice with something in the middle. And if people eat, they don't they don't take the fish out of it. I watch people eating. Okay, but but you're not a. If you say you don't like it, you don't eat it. Uh, you can't be me neither. We can't be part of the the, the group that judges it. Uh, right. And what does it mean? I think Rosh Hashanah says if it, let's say if it's over fifty percent. If it's over, I think it's Rosh Hashanah or someone else says it. If it's over fifty percent of people who today will eat raw fish, then that would mean that it's not a. Um, there's no bishalakum, but we don't like it. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't apply. We have to hear from sushi eaters what they uh, they think. If um, Jack says, follow the money. People pay big money for the fish, not for the rice or the seaweed. So it's not secondary. That's a very good point. And there's a lot of people who won't eat sushi if it's just the sushi with the um, the vegetables in it. They dafka want the fish. Um, you're right, Ruth. It's Mr. Spock. What am I talking about? Now, Dr. Spock was a psychologist, right? Mr. Spock. You see, I'm not a Trekkie. So I didn't. Chaim says, and I thank Chaim. You're the one who's also sent me a number of the sources. You say, I think of Shekhar's point is that the primacy of the sushi is the rice. Sushi would lose its identity without the rice. Evident, especially from the fact that the word itself means sour rice. Yeah, but if the... If the um, if the way he describes it is, it's not... It doesn't have independent... He says no one eats it separately. So that's his point. You don't eat it separately. You only eat it together with the uh, rice because very few people eat the sashimi. So in the first letter, he thinks it doesn't matter. But in the set, the one that's published, the Dafa he, he says if they're eaten together, then you do not regard it as its own independent item. The other sources I read to you don't make that distinction at all. And um, he cites... Um, he cites not here, but in the first letter, he cites a Darche Tshuva that uh, would seem, as I recall, would seem to imply that. But uh, hold on a second. Uh, oh, he cites the Darche Tshuva is the father of the uh, the Munkash. Well, he's a as well. He's a, also was a rav in uh, Munkach. Um, okay, I don't I don't know what I do with my page, but I think he cites the uh, Darche Tshuva. That implies that, um, but there he rejects it. Uh, he says, like, if something is in salad, oh, here it is. Yeah, I found it. In the Darche Tshuva, Kuf Yud Gimel, um, he's, no, he cites something that, uh, the Darche Tshuva speak about something that gives it a little bit spice or something like that, but he says that uh, here the vegetables don't change the tom of the dog. So in Shakhtar's first letter, he says something different. So I don't know. I don't know really the source of this idea. Rebelsi agrees with it, though. The other sources don't mention it, that uh, just because you eat the raw fish together with rice, therefore the raw fish doesn't have independent entity. Even though people are only eating it because, I, like, you can make the argument that... Um, I know they have the question about the wraps, what bracha you make on the wrap. But um, if you have a hamburger, granted, we assume that bread potters everything else. But is any, when you have a hamburger with meat, you know, hamburger has meat. Uh, are you going to say that the meat is really secondary to the hamburger? No, each are independent. We want the roll, but we also want the beef. Um, I, it's a tough one. Um Jack says primacy is relative. Yes, you can make sour right. Okay. You're married to a sushi lover. You know the distinguishing feature of sushi or the type and quality of the fish. So for a shakter, that doesn't matter. He has this idea that if you eat it only together with something else, it's not independent. Therefore, it's not bishalakum. But for the other sources I gave you, um, it, it definitely matters. Uh, and it should be, uh, it should change the bishalakum. Uh, Morris says, there's a well-known Yiddish expression about a young person who shows unusual wisdom is referred to as an altar cup. In other words, wise beyond his years. Yeah, yeah, we all know that expression. Yeah, Thank you. How'd it go from Spectre to Rabinowitz? I want to keep you here so you, you come back in uh, three weeks. If you know Rabbi Rakefetz's talks, he constantly repeats a story. But uh, the evidence is not like the story he repeats, but I'll tell you where he got this story from, because he got it from a reliable source also. But what he says is not the story in the family. Um, um, Dov says, oh, and you were in Slobodka, I think with uh, Schneer Lyman. Uh, the old wooden Slobodka building is gone, but the new brick one still stands. I mean, the one from the 1930. Okay, that one still stands, yeah. 
Oh, and I have to look in your article on uh, Rav Ruderman. So when I asked for the Sabatka building, I was asking for the the, the classic building. Uh, um, Paul says the best kosher sushi on the planet is Nama Sushi in Boca Raton. Not cheap, but otherworldly. Any royal table would love it. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's... Um, and, um, and Rabbi should know, who was stationed with the U.S. Navy for three years in Japan, chief rabbi of Japan, says, don't ask me about sushi. You were in Japan for uh, three years. You know, Rabbi should know, I was only in Japan for a little over a week, and they never even offered me at the kosher places. They never even offered me sushi, which is good. So Paul says the fish is primary. Again, Paul, the fish is primary. But Rav Schechter is saying, as long as you eat it, in his first letter, the fact he would say then it's it's not Bishalakum. But in the second letter, he says he can acknowledge the fish is primary. But he says you only eat the fish together with something. Well, I should I take that back. He doesn't he doesn't say the fish is primary. I take that back because he says that uh, you only make a mizonos. He says, Kasha Likboa Shadag Hua Ikar Shibasushi. He says it's hard to say that the, the, the fish is the ikar and the sushi. Now, all the sushi eaters I know say, yes, the sushi, the fish is the ikar, and the rice is separate, secondary. So here we have the same thing with Rabbi Tendler. Rav Schechter is the pose, but he's saying the fish is not secondary, but if the fish is secondary. But if every sushi eater you find says, no, the fish is primary, are we bound to Rav Schechter's psak? Because the Messias is wrong. Um, and he says that's why you make him his onos. He doesn't even say you make two brachas. So it's a big machokas. I It'd be curious to see in the coming years if um, we develop a certain um, you know binding psak or not. Um, um, oh, so I think Hadassah, maybe that's that's the building you're showing me, Sabaka. That's not the classic building, that's the last building. Thank you. Um, which I didn't see. Um, and finally, Rabbi Shudno says our local kosher supermarket has a kosher sushi section. Well, yeah, I mean, that's very common today. As I said, um, I was in San Antonio a couple of weeks ago, and uh, lo and behold, even in San Antonio, Texas, they have a kosher aisle, a nice kosher aisle there, they have a nice show, and they have sushi. Because uh, God forbid that the Jews uh, be without their sushi today. I want to wish you all Chag Kasher V'Sameach and Chag Sameach, depending if you're at the hotels or if you're at home. And uh, it's. Uh, I hope we come back in a few weeks and nothing crazy, nothing insane happens. And uh, and uh, that's all. And uh, we'll think about each other. And uh, Rabbi Kalman, you do you eat eat rice. I eat rice. I love rice. Uh, but not sushi, okay? All right. I'm yeah, just yeah, curious. Sushi. You know what? I've never even tried it. It's just not appealing to me. My wife oh. likes it, but generally she just eats the vegetable ones because she says usually they're not so fresh. But at a good simcha with a good sushi, she goes for the fish also. And she doesn't think the rice is secondary. The fish is... The... Yeah. All right. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anyways, all right. Um, thank, thank you, Jacob, for sending me this because there's a real stira in Rav Schechter's... Uh, Position here, yeah. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Thank no, you. no, no problem. Okay, Kesach We'll see you. Please, God, here back in three weeks, and of course, we'll see everybody else. Hopefully, uh, this week, tomorrow, as I mentioned, Rabbi Shulman will be back in his you know Tuesday slot talking on Pesach tomorrow, followed by a thing on the art history, the history of the Seder plate from an artistic point of view. So that's at one and two fifteen tomorrow. Uh, and then we have 1 p.m. on Wednesday and Thursday. And then my shear on the sitter this week will transfer to the Haggadah. And uh, Menachem Ligdeg will be giving a shear on Pesach on Sunday morning at 11.15. Okay, everybody. Be well. I'll call a second. Well, That's all the crazy happens. Only good thing to end that. Hodul Hashem that uh, And then the, the miracles that we witnessed the other night should continue. And uh, the ghoulish lame to come and Paul, I feel bad that you can't make it to Israel for Yom Tiv, but uh, hopefully you'll be okay in New York. All right. Anyways, slide the top, everybody. Be well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.